Albert Einstein, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, John F. Kennedy, Tony Robbins, Michael Phelps, Will Smith. That sounds like a list of highly successful titans in a variety of industries. What else do they have in common? Well, they all have ADHD, but you don't hear much about that, do you? You know what you hear even less about? The successful women navigating ADHD. And that's exactly why I started this podcast, ADHD for Smartass Women. I'm your host, Tracy Otsuka. I'm an attorney, not a doctor, a lifelong student, not a coach. I'm also the creator of Cortography, a patent pending system that helps people like you figure out what they should do with their life. And we're here today to talk ADHD, your superpowers, your symptoms, your workarounds, and how you proudly stand out instead of trying to fit in. I credit my ADHD for some of my greatest superpowers. And you know what? I spy a happier life for you, too. So without further ado, a shiny new episode is starting now. Hello, I am Tracy Otsuka, and I wanted to welcome you to episode 44 of ADHD for Smartass Women. This week, I am going to tackle bipolar disorder and ADHD, and it's going to be in two parts. Last week, I recorded an episode that's going to be airing after this episode with the brilliant M. Elizabeth Megan, who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when, in fact, what she really had was ADHD. Now, you probably know me well enough to know I'm kind of a Pollyanna. I always see the bright side of anything. Honestly, sometimes it's to a fault. And so this subject of bipolar disorder, it just seems so heavy and dark. So I just did not want to research it. You know, I felt the same way about rejection-sensitive dysphoria, RSD, which I have to say is one of my most downloaded podcast episodes. A lot of you are interested in RSD. And this is the thing, after I spoke with M, what she said to me about her bipolar disorder, excuse me, about being misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder when in fact it was ADHD, what she said was so impactful and so important that I just felt it warranted more research and a separate episode on my part. And then I had lunch with a friend who told me her best friend's daughter was diagnosed with bipolar disorder when in fact they now believe it was ADHD. And that prompted me to ask in our Facebook group, ADHD for Smartass Women, who here has been misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder? Based on the responses, I was literally sent off into the research rabbit hole. It was literally just one woman after another who posted their story. Women like Fran, who told us that she was misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder too, twice. One doctor put her on medication that made her suicidal. She doesn't believe she was ever bipolar and has since been diagnosed with ADHD. Leah shared that she was diagnosed as a teen with clinical depression with bipolar tendencies, whatever that is. It took her 17 years of a wrong diagnosis to finally get diagnosed with ADHD at 29. She also discovered that she didn't even have depression, as it was actually the result of her untreated ADHD. Like M, who you'll meet next week, she too became suicidal on antidepressants. Chandra shared that she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in her early 30s. She, too, was put on bipolar meds and reported becoming suicidal. Chandra got off all of her bipolar medication and was recently diagnosed with ADHD and dyscalculia. I always mispronounce that. It's um, problems with math. She's been on a stimulant for seven months, but reports that she's happy and definitely not bipolar. Freya shared that she was also misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder. At 33, she has finally been diagnosed with ADHD. She's pretty much certain that the bipolar diagnosis was a misdiagnosis, and she believes that her depression and anxiety were likely a result of her untreated ADHD. Paige mentioned something that several women also volunteered. She had been diagnosed as a child with ADHD, but then she forgot about it. 
Later on, she was diagnosed as bipolar, but it never felt like an accurate diagnosis. So she stopped taking her meds. Years later, a psychologist mentioned ADHD, and Paige suddenly remembered that, oh my gosh, yeah, I had been diagnosed with that years before. Paige is now on ADHD medication. She's focused on her strengths and implementing holistic changes like exercise, coaching, cognitive behavioral therapy, reducing her alcohol consumption, and she says she feels so much better. Bipolar disorder is often misdiagnosed during the teenage years, and it gets worse when teens or young adults are not given the right medication. If you don't have bipolar disorder and you're put on lithium or Dapacode, you will get a lot worse. On the flip side, if you're diagnosed with ADHD and you're put on stimulants, but you really have bipolar disorder, not ADHD, your bipolar symptoms will also likely get worse. Unlike ADHD, which many people ignore and don't take seriously, if you mention bipolar disorder, that scares people. They want to move to the other side of the room. But I want to tell you that when treated, Many adults with bipolar disorder get married, they have kids, they live happy, productive lives, and there is a real upside to bipolar disorder if managed correctly. You know, we can just talk about all the negatives of this serious illness, but I think it's also important that we acknowledge that there are some real positives as well. Again, your brain may have these weaknesses, but it can also have some real strengths, and we're going to talk about them in a bit. So what exactly is bipolar disorder? Well, bipolar disorder is like ADHD in that there's no single test to confirm the condition. You can't take a blood test or see it on an x-ray. It refers to the shifting between poles, depression and mania or hypomania, but just like ADHD, it doesn't present the same for every person. So if you're bipolar, you can tend more towards depression or more towards mania or hypomania, or you can alternate between the two. People with bipolar disorder, they feel intense bouts of sadness and hopelessness one moment, and the next moment they can be energetic and full of optimism. You should also know that thyroid issues can mimic bipolar symptoms. So 2.6% of adults in the U.S. are affected, by bipolar disorder, that's 5.7 million adult Americans. The median age of onset is 25, although the illness can start in early childhood or as late as in our 40s and 50s. An equal number of men and women develop bipolar disorder, and it doesn't discriminate based on age, race, or social class. There is also definitely a heritable component. Bipolar disorder is the sixth leading cause of disability in the world. 70% of bipolar patients are misdiagnosed at least once. 70%. That is just crazy. On average, patients with bipolar disorder wait a whopping 17 years before they receive an accurate diagnosis. You know, I thought it was strange that several of the women that responded in our Facebook group mentioned that it took them 17 years. Bipolar disorder must be treated. You know, just like untreated depression, if you don't treat your bipolar symptoms, you are more likely to get worse and they become more dangerous over time. Having bipolar disorder, it's serious. You know, 25 to 50% of those that are diagnosed as bipolar attempt suicide at least once. The Center for Disease Control and Prevention cites ADHD as the most commonly diagnosed behavioral condition in children under 18. ADHD is frequently misdiagnosed as anxiety, bipolar disorder, depression, or OCD. The flip side to that is that bipolar symptoms mimic ADHD symptoms during the manic phase. Symptoms like restlessness, trouble sleeping and hyperactivity, and during the depressed phase, symptoms like lack of focus and inattention. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about mania. What is mania? So the DSM, and again, that stands for the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. You know how much I hate that term. The DSM, and and of course, the DSM is what healthcare professionals use to diagnose various mental illnesses, 
So the DSM defines mania as a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood. The manic symptoms, they have to last at least a week, and they have at least three of the following symptoms. Number one, inflated self-esteem or grandiosity. Number two, little need for sleep. You know, sleep deprivation is a leading trigger for manic and depressive episodes. Number three, an increased rate of speech. So you're talking really fast. Number four, flights of ideas that make no sense. Number five, getting easily distracted. Number six, dramatic increase in very goal-directed activity. When you're in a manic state, you can be very, very productive. Number seven, psychomotor agitation. So you're pacing your hands. I mean, you're, you're pacing about. You're wringing your hands. Number eight, an increased pursuit of activities with a high risk of danger. Okay, so now let's talk about the depressive um, symptoms. The DSM states that a major depressive episode must have at least four of the following symptoms, and they should be new or suddenly worse, and they must last for at least two weeks. So you need four of the following symptoms. Increase or decrease in appetite, weight, sleep, or psychomotor activity. So you're really physically active. Decreased energy. Keep in mind that depression isn't always in a vegetative state. You can also look physically agitated and anxious. Feelings of worthlessness or guilt and or thoughts of death or suicidal plans or attempts. And this is serious. You know, the greatest risk for those of us with um, bipolar disorder, it's suicide. Suicide is more likely to happen in the manic phase rather than the depressive phase. And it makes sense, right? You're much more active. So now we know what the manic and depressive phases look like in bipolar disorder. You also now need to know that there are several types of bipolar disorder. The first one is bipolar one. And this involves one or more manic episodes or mixed episodes, so both manic and depressive, and it may include a major depressive episode. These episodes are not due to a medical condition or substance use, which of course means that you can't be diagnosed with bipolar disorder when your manic episode is brought about because of a bad reaction to medication. And you'll know why this is important when you listen to our guest M next week. Bipolar 1 affects 1 to 2% of the population. In bipolar 2, you have one or more major depressive episodes with at least one hypomanic episode. So there are no manic episodes. Hypomania, it's less severe than mania. It doesn't disrupt your ability to function as much as bipolar 1. When you think of bipolar disorder and how it's depicted in Hollywood movies, hypomania is probably what you're thinking of. And it's one to 2% of the population is affected by bipolar two. Man, that's a tongue twister. Hypomania may be less severe, but again, it's not necessarily less debilitating. It can look like anxiety and depression. It affects more women. You have a tremendous amount of anxiety and depression. It's much more, well, there's much more rejection sensitivity there. The suicide rate is also just as high. In bipolar 2, the symptoms must still cause a lot of distress or problems at work, school, relationships, I should say with relationships. Often people who experience hypomania, they don't even remember their hypomanic episodes. Okay, what is the third type of bipolar disorder? It's called cyclothemia, and it's characterized by changing low-level depression with periods of hypomania. The symptoms have to be present for at least two years in adults or one year in children before a diagnosis can be made. Adults will have symptom-free periods that can last no longer than two months. Children and teens may have symptom-free periods that last only about a month. Okay, the fourth kind of bipolar disorder or type of bipolar disorder is called rapid cycling bipolar disorder. And this is a very severe form of bipolar disorder. In the course of a day, you can experience both mania and depression. This is more common in women than men. 
The final type of bipolar disorder is called NOS or not otherwise specified. In this category, it's for symptoms of bipolar disorder that don't fit clearly into the other types. You know, perhaps there are multiple symptoms, but there's not enough of them, or they don't last long enough to be true manic or depressive episodes. This also includes multiple hypomanic episodes without a major depressive episode. It would go into the NOS category. So how do you distinguish between bipolar disorder and ADHD? You know, we already talked about the fact that, you know, the, the symptoms can often mimic each other. Well, again, bipolar disorder, it can look a lot like ADHD because of the high energy level both of these conditions have. So you have the mania in bipolar disorder. It can look like high energy, distractibility, impulsivity, and a willingness to engage in high risk behavior. So how do you tell the two apart? Well, you do so by the level of intensity. Edward Hallowell and John Rady, they tell us in their book, Driven to Distraction, that, and the link's going to be in the show notes, that you can copy the behavior of ADHD, but you could not do so with bipolar disorder. Mania, it's the most extreme form of non-drug-induced drivenness that we know. This also means that if you're not manic, but your medication makes you manic, I keep repeating this, that that is not bipolar disorder. And this is important because, again, what I discovered is so many women in our Facebook group reported being misdiagnosed with bipolar disorder because they were put on medication, usually SSRIs, antidepressant medication that made them manic. Again, we'll talk more about that next week. So how else can we explain the differences? Well, first of all, People with bipolar disorder, they go through intense emotional changes that are very different from their usual mood and behavior. You know, with bipolar disorder, it feels like an overall cloud or state, something that's coming from the internal and then spilling out. With ADHD, it's really contextual. People with ADHD, we respond from the external in. And you've heard me say a lot about how important environment is to our success and happiness. You know, our unhappiness is usually situational. We are in the wrong environment, the wrong job, hanging around the wrong people. We can control our feelings by usually changing our environment. When you're bipolar, there's no rhyme or reason to why you suddenly feel depressed. Bipolar disorder is described as episodic versus contextual. People with ADHD, we generally feel the same way day to day. You know, we may feel down about a specific thing that we're upset about, but we typically can state the reason why we don't feel good and we still feel like ourselves. When those with bipolar disorder are depressed, however, they feel really different than themselves. They also feel that there's nothing that they can do about it, that they don't have control over how they're feeling. With ADHD, there's a feeling of more control. If we can find that thing that is stimulating, our mood can change immediately. With bipolar disorder, you're in a depressive state and nothing makes you feel better. How else can we explain the differences between ADHD and bipolar disorder? By manic or hypomanic symptoms. You know, the Hollywood version, you know, what we see in the movies is, you know, someone who feels really great. They're on top of the world. They're super productive. They aren't sleeping. Well, another version is extreme irritability. You feel like you are jumping out of your skin and you have this out of control, revved up energy. With bipolar disorder, there may be an overly inflated sense of self-esteem, feelings of grandiosity, narcissism, and definitely a decreased need for sleep without feeling tired. Those of us with ADHD, we may feel that you know, directed sense of purpose, that hyper-focus, that drivenness, but once we're done, we're tired and we're crashing. With bipolar disorder, you don't have that. You wish you could go to sleep, but you can't. There's this electricity that's going on in your body, and this can go on for a week. And if you can't sleep for a week, your thinking gets really bizarre. It's horrible. You can literally go psychotic. How else is ADHD and bipolar disorder different? Well, there can be uncontrollable talking and distractibility in ADHD. You know, we're talking too fast. We're talking about one thing and then we're going completely off topic. But when you're manic, 
The difference is you're totally out of control. You cannot have a logical conversation. You don't just drift off topic. You say things that make no sense. And I want to give you an example that, again, Edward Hallowell and John Rady share in their book, Driven to Distraction. It's on page 211. And this was one of, I believe it was, you know, I don't know whose client it was, but it was one of their, excuse me, patients. And this is what they said. They said, good morning, Mr. Jones. And then the patient said, why, good morning, doctor, and good morning to all the lovely little squiggles you have on your tie and to squiggles everywhere, who, by the way, are outward representations of chaos, a soon-to-be-quantified branch of physics and mathematics, which, if you haven't boned up on your integrals, will leave you without much hope of doing more than passing over the topic, as the cow passes over the moon and the ditty, which you may have heard when you were a child. You were once a child, doctor. It is safe to assume that we all were children once. That is a safe assumption, the first three letters of which are A-S-S. So don't be an ass and assume anything. As my old teacher used to say, sound advice, especially for a planetary stargazer. Wouldn't you say there is more in the stars than there is in every brain put together, like link sausages, a delicious breakfast at that. Now, if you have ADHD, you don't sound like that. You know, your behavior and your speech, again, you may veer off topic, but there's a reason for, there is a way to connect how you moved from one thing to another versus with bipolar disorder, there isn't. Again, if you have ADHD, your behavior is consistent. You may be hyperverbal, but you're hyperverbal consistently. Like you're always talking and talking fast, right? When you're manic, you're extremely distractible. Your thoughts are moving so fast that they don't even, you know, you don't even know what you're thinking. It's just noise that takes over. In ADHD, we have a lot of fast thoughts, but we're aware of them. We see them when we have ADHD, even though we may have trouble remembering them, putting them in order and expressing them. The distractibility in bipolar disorder is not because they're finding other things that are interesting to them. With those with bipolar disorder, they wouldn't ordinarily be distracted by these things to begin with. How else are those with bipolar disorder different than those with ADHD? Well, with bipolar disorder and ADHD, you'll see individuals who have a high degree of empathy. These are very sensitive people. With ADHD, rejection sensitivity, it's often a normal emotional reaction, but just ratcheted up. It's, it's a bit more intense. Keep in mind, though, that we often also have 20,000 more negative messages hurled at us by the time we're 12 than a neurotypical child would. So that will definitely affect self-esteem and, of course, make you more sensitive. With bipolar disorder, it's even more intense. There's usually no trigger, meaning that had the same thing happened two days before, there wouldn't have been a reaction at all. But today, there is a huge oversized reaction. Rejection sensitivity, it's a result of a cognitive distortion with bipolar disorder. They're imagining things. They can be paranoid. They're making things up in their head that just aren't true. We also, with ADHD, don't generally struggle with recurrent thoughts of death or suicide as those with bipolar disorder do. In fact, I always marvel at how resilient those of us with ADHD actually are. We don't give up. We are actually very optimistic. Okay, so now let's talk about the difference between ADHD and bipolar disorder in kids and teenagers. And so what I did was I looked to expert Dr. Robert Olivardia to get information on how to determine is it bipolar or ADHD in kids. And Dr. Robert Olivardia, he's a clinical instructor of psychology at Harvard Medical School and a clinical associate at McLean Hospital. He's also an expert in ADHD and he has a private psychology practice. And he states that it's more likely to be bipolar disorder if symptoms weren't present at birth. So when you have a child who's difficult from birth, they're colicky, they don't sleep well, they're constantly moving, they're you know more agitated, they may cry a lot, it's more likely ADHD. Mood dysregulation that you see in bipolar is more random or cyclical. The mood shifts are really different than what you see in ADHD. So for example, bipolar teens, they will rage for hours. 
It's called a limbic rage. And you don't see that as much with ADHD. You know, with ADHD, they'll be upset, but if they're distracted or exhausted, they'll almost forget about it. You also don't see psychosis in ADHD versus you do see this in bipolar disorder. There's grandiose claims of self-importance. You know, I'm God. I invented Facebook. Bizarre thought patterns. These kids and teenagers, they're just much more destructive and violent. They also respond well to mood stabilizer. Bipolar disorder does, however, exist in children. You know, these kids tend to be very precocious, highly gifted, but they suffer from night terrors. They'll talk about gore and death and murder and suicide. They have hallucinations. They can even exhibit some paranoia. We also know that in ADHD, there are often comorbid conditions, right? And bipolar disorder is one of them. So ADHD and bipolar disorder can coexist. In fact, Olivardi believes that 70% of people with bipolar disorder have ADHD and 20% of people with ADHD have bipolar disorder. Now, ADHD expert Russell Barkley, he doesn't believe this 20% statistic, and he states that most studies, including his own, have not found this to be true. He does, however, state that adults with bipolar disorder do have a higher risk for ADHD, and that risk is... 20 to 25% for those with adult onset bipolar disorder, 35 to 45% for those with adolescent onset bipolar disorder, and 80 to 97% of those with child onset bipolar disorder also have ADHD. So when you have both bipolar disorder and ADHD, both conditions are worse. So it's even more important to get an adequate diagnosis because the medication that you would use for bipolar disorder, ADHD, or even major depression, they're all totally different. You know, lithium, which is prescribed for mania, usually makes ADHD symptoms much worse. SSRIs usually make your bipolar and ADHD symptoms much worse. For some, ADHD stimulants can make their bipolar disorder worse. So for for others, they can take those stimulants if they have both ADHD and bipolar disorder. Again, we're all science experiments because our brains are so different. So you won't know how you react until you try. If you're diagnosed with bipolar disorder, however, but lithium doesn't work, you really should ask, is there any chance it could be ADHD instead? And if you have ADHD, you might also have a mood disorder beyond emotional dysregulation. You know, a third of those with ADHD have an anxiety disorder. 60 to 70% have learning differences. According to Dr. Olivardia, the problem is that many people who are experts in bipolar disorder do not have a solid fundamental understanding of ADHD, and many people who are expert in ADHD don't have a solid fundamental understanding of bipolar disorder. You know, neuropsych testing, it doesn't help because it doesn't show bipolar disorder. If you're in a depressed episode, you're going to have much higher depressed scores. If you're in a manic episode, those scores will be completely different. So it all would depend on when are you even taking this test. Experts really need to make sure that they're asking the right questions. And if you're a patient, you need to know that most experts, they don't have an expertise in both areas. So it may be in your best interest to see an ADHD specialist and then follow that up with a specialist in bipolar disorder if you suspect that you might have both or something's not quite right. Dr. Olivardi also mentioned something that I thought was really interesting. You know, a lot of people think that if you have a fiery, intense temper, that that's ADHD. And in his words, it is not. When you look at bipolar versus ADHD rage, they are completely different in intensity. With ADHD kids, it's the same battle every day. If you tell them no video games, they're going to pitch a fit every single time you tell them that. But five minutes later, they'll be distracted by something else and they won't even remember that they were upset about that. In a bipolar rage, first of all, what that child is upset about today, may, he may not be upset about tomorrow. There's no consistency. Bipolar rages, they're unpredictable. They're scary. It sounds like, this is according to Dr. Olivardi again, it sounds like someone is trying to kill the child and they can last for six or more hours. Those kids, the bipolar kids, they also feel really remorseful after the rages happen. They know that something took over their body and that they had no control over it. 
versus ADHD kids, they feel much less remorse. You know, often they act like nothing happened. <laughs> I remember with my son, he would pitch a huge fit over something ridiculous, probably something like no more video games, right? He would slam the doors. He'd be so upset. And then five minutes later, he'd come into the kitchen and he'd look at me and he'd say, hey, mom, what's for dinner? And I was so angry. And he didn't even remember, number one, that he pitched the fit. And number two, he couldn't understand why I was so angry. So Dr. Olivardi also mentions that kids that are diagnosed with conduct disorder or oppositional defiance disorder are at a higher risk for bipolar disorder. Some studies suggest that those who are diagnosed with conduct disorder or ODD, as it's called, oppositional defiant disorder as kids, but then are later diagnosed with bipolar disorder, that this conduct disorder or ODD may actually be the child form of bipolar disorder. On the flip side to that, conduct disorder or ODD with ADHD as a child could also be a kid who's just rebelling at an environment that is not working for them at all. I guess you could say that for an adult as well. Okay, so let's talk about the positive of, well, both, but especially bipolar disorder. So the upside for both ADHD and bipolar disorder is creativity. Most of our famous artists had bipolar disorder. Dr. Gail Saltz, who is an associate professor in psychiatry at Cornell Medical School, she wrote a fantastic book. You've heard me talk about it before. It's called The Power of Different, The Link Between Disorder and Genius. What she does in this book is she goes through various mental health challenges from schizophrenia to bipolar disorder to ADHD borderline personality disorder. I mean, a lot, you know, anxiety, depression. And she really talks about the link between disorder and genius and how some of our brightest people have a mental health issue. So in this book, when we're talking about bipolar disorder, she talks about how hypomania is linked to creativity. We have Ernest Hemingway and Anne Sexton and F. F. Scott Fitzgerald, Virginia Woolf, Vincent Van Gogh, Beethoven, Winston Churchill, Frank Sinatra. They are all believed to have had bipolar disorder, and the list goes on and on. More modern-day examples give us Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys, Mariah Carey, Ben Stiller. I never knew about Ben Stiller. Kurt Cobain, Ted Turner. So there's a lot of them. And Dr. Saltz talks about the fact that there have been multiple studies that scientifically and clinically prove that bipolar disorder is linked to the creative and artistic temperament. She mentions a Swedish study of 700,000 teenagers where researchers found that the highest performing kids tested were four times more likely to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder within 10 years. So we are talking about very intelligent people. Saltz goes on to state that the bipolar brain is so strongly linked to various forms of creativity that those diagnosed, listen to this, this is fascinating, that those diagnosed with bipolar one are more likely to write when trending towards hypomania. And those diagnosed with bipolar two are more likely to draw. This heightened creativity or artistry, it only happens in hypomania. And this is because of the prefrontal cortex. You've heard about the prefrontal cortex, right? It's that part of the brain that's linked to your executive functions. It's concerned with rules and structure. And this is the thing. If it's slightly impaired, that actually makes you more creative, out of the box and atypical. But there has to be some balance. You have to pick the right ideas to pursue, and then you have to be able to move those ideas forward. Otherwise, no one is going to know that you're even creative, right? So once you get to mania, you lose the balance, and the prefrontal cortex is ignored and overwhelmed. Dr. Sachs mentions that the creativity in bipolar disorder, it's a really specific type of creativity. It's the ability to take two disparate things and make a connection between them that others don't see and then put the whole thing together. You know, they can see all the pieces at the same time. And she talks about Bill Lichtenstein, who's an award-winning broadcast journalist who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in 1987. 
he decided that he wanted to create a documentary on bipolar disorder. He knew every piece of the documentary and what he wanted it to show from people with bipolar disorder to experts talking about it. He even knew he wanted Patty Duke to narrate it. He didn't know Patty Duke, but he saw the completed project before he even started. And I don't know about you, but my ADHD brain can definitely relate to this seeing of the big picture, the whole picture, before I've even started work on a project that I'm really excited about. So anyway, I really hope that this podcast gives you a pretty good overview of the differences between ADHD and bipolar disorder and gives you a place to start if, for example, you've been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but it doesn't feel right and you've always wondered if it's ADHD or vice versa, you've been diagnosed with ADHD and feel like that's not the complete picture either and you share some of the bipolar uh, disorder symptoms, I really hope that this gives you a, a place to start. So that's what I have for you today. As always, you are listening to ADHD for Smart Ass Women. You know, if you've been listening to me for a while, I would really appreciate a review. It's not hard to do. You do not even have to write anything, although I am so appreciative if you do. If you're on the iTunes podcast platform, you can scroll down to the bottom. You can click on the stars. You can write a review. If you'd like to know more about me, our patent pending cartography system that teaches you how to figure out which of the many interests you have is the one that you should actually pursue. Or if you have a comment, a guest you'd like me to interview, or a topic idea for this podcast, go to my website at tracyoutsuka.com and click on podcast in the navigation bar. You're going to see a microphone to your right where you can leave me an audio message. You can also reach out to me at tracy at tracyoutsuka.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next week. You've been listening to the ADHD for Smart Ass Women podcast. I'm your host, Tracy Atsuka, and we're available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and Google Play. If you liked what you heard, we sure would appreciate a review. And not coincidentally, ADHD for Smart Ass Women, well, that's also the name of our free Facebook group. Go look it up. We're a totally smart ass community of successful, ambitious women who share our ADHD wins, questions, and workarounds. We'd love to have you join us. You can also find all my details over at tracyoutsuka.com. Don't forget, I spy a happier life for us, and I'll see you again next week.